wonderful, marvelous are the works of your hands, God. Great is your name. Wonderful, marvelous are the works of my God. I 
live, I will love you forever because this God is too good. Oh, yes. Hey, hey. This God is too good. Oh, and your mercies endure it forever. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to welcome you for the final and the sixth session of the Spiritual Foundation, a Spiritual Emphasis Program for our month of fatness and fitness. I'd like us to lift up our hands to heaven and thank Jesus for all he helped us do on, in the first session, in the second session, the third session, the fourth session, the fifth session. I'd like us to thank him in advance because he's going to bring forth the best wine tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'd like to announce that this Sunday, in all of our services, there will be an anointing service as we begin to cross over into the sixth, uh, the final the final half of this year, 2023. I believe that 
inheritances and portions will be divided. And I believe that the next six months will be settled at that anointing service. We want to make sure you invite everyone connected and affiliated to you for that service. And as you do that, my God will bless you. Also, for the next six or so days, we're going to be online for next week, Monday or Tuesday. For the next six days, we're going to be praying that God will honor us with everything he's taught us. The things he's revealed to us are supposed to be uh, prayed back to him for him to bring about manifestation in our space and in our lives. So you want to look forward to that in the coming six or so days. Hallelujah. So it's a great privilege for me to be back with you. And uh, our anchor text is the same thing. Psalms 36 and verse 8, the Bible says, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house, and you will cause, uh, or, and they shall, you shall make them drink of the rivers of your pleasure. The second scripture is Isaiah 10, verse 27. It says, In that day, the burden shall be, their burden will be lifted from your shoulder, their yoke from off your neck. The yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing, KJV said, and uh, NIV said, because you have grown so far. Now, in Proverbs 13, verse 4, the Bible says the soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. I want to use uh, for a title, my last session, A Call to Diligence. A Call to Diligence. Let us pray, Father, I humble myself before you, once again asking that you would help us pass across what matters not noise but substance in the name of the lord jesus i'm asking that whatever is in me that belongs to them will be released in this sixth session in the name of the lord jesus heavenly father i'm asking for utterance i'm asking for entrance i'm asking that your word will find a crack and a crevice in the lives of your people that your light will shine upon the lives of your people in the name of the lord jesus I'm asking that you confound the application of these truths with signs and wonders following in the life of every one of our people. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. And somebody says, Amen. So, we're talking here about a call to diligence. In Proverbs it says, They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of his house, and that the Lord will cause them to drink of the river of his pleasures. Now, in Isaiah 10, verse 27, it says, the reason why the yoke will be destroyed is because we have grown so fat. And now, who is qualified for fatness? In Proverbs 13, verse 4, the Bible tells us that the soul of the sluggard desires but has nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. So diligence, therefore, is one of the keys to fatness. Diligence is one of the keys to fatness. As we talk about fatness and fitness, you know there's a connection between your activity. Hallelujah. Your activity. You have the right activities, you're going to be fit. And I want to talk about, I feel led to talk about diligence today because sincerely, we must make sure that our desires are not coming from a place of slothfulness. Because it says here, the soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing. Amen. I can't forget we're young, lazy men hanging around. What will you do now if somebody gives you one million? What will you do now if somebody gives you? You know, those are the kind of conversations. We were never talking about the responsibilities we're going to take. We we're always talking about people giving us. Apparently, all those seasons, nobody gave us anything. Amen. So the soul of the sluggard desires, it's not going to get anything, but the soul of the diligent will be made fat. Now, in looking at that scripture, when it says the yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat, he's saying here also that you can use diligence to bring about fatness 
and break the yoke. Esau comes to mind. I, I'm not talking about Esau now. I think it was Esau and Jacob. And it says, when you become restless, you will break his yoke from off your neck. So there are yokes that respond to restlessness or diligence, being diligent, diligently applying ourselves to whatever we do. Why is this very important? In fact, I think the Proverbs 13, 4 scripture, I think the New King James Version said, the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Please look for it for them. I think it says, the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. So the New King James substitutes fatness for richness. To be rich means to have an abundant supply. The soul of diligence shall be made rich. Now, when you study this subject of diligence, you press down in Proverbs 10, 4, it says, he becomes poor that deals with a slack hand. So if you're the kind of person who you handle things with a slack hand, you handle your career with a slack hand, you handle opportunities with a slack hand, you handle your marriage with a slack hand, he says, poverty becomes your prophecy. He becomes poor huh, that deals with a slack hand. I'm reminded now of when I was a, a younger man and I had some women in my space that I was prospecting for marriage. And one of them was gossiping to the other person that I can't marry Cornell, you know, I can't marry him all. He's too serious. <laughs> he's too serious. When the kids got to my wife, my wife said, well, I just think he's, I just think he's hardworking. That gap, somebody feels you're too serious, another person feels you're hardworking, can make the difference between life and death. Of course, I settled for the one who believed I was hardworking, not for the one who believed I was too serious. Because if you handle things with levity, if you take things with levity, there are people here who take their lives with levity. They take their business, their calling with levity. They take their marriages with levity. They take their covenant relationships with levity. He says, you're going to become poor. You're going to become poor. One thing that has helped me over the years is seriousness. I'm not, I'm not I also play sometimes, but sincerely, I don't play. One of the things I don't play with is my work. Amen. I don't play with my work. I don't play around my work. And you don't play with my work. He says, the one who deals with a slack hand will become poor. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. So if you're dealing with things with levity, the slack hand, you become poor. But if you're diligent, you're dealing with things with a strong hand, it's like a driver who's driving a car without a firm grip and a firm grasp. That car is going to have an accident. I, I mean, I don't like seeing drivers with one hand, no matter how professional they are. Like drivers with one hand, I don't like it. I, I don't even like it. I want to see both hands. Are you getting what I'm saying? On the steering. Because you're talking about steering, you're talking about direction. He becomes poor that deals with his slack. And a lot of people now, you look at the way they handle their marriages, so slack. You look at the way they handle their covenant relationships, so slack. You look at the way they handle their callings, so, they're just, just, just so slack. You look at the way they handle their business, so, so they take it with levity. He says that then poverty becomes their prophecy. However, if they can deal with things with a diligent hand, he says, they're going to be made rich. Some time ago, I was listening to Bishop Edu and he said something that when he was a younger man on campus and they were serving God, they were serving God, laying their foundation of service. Some guy said in Yoruba, in Komaten Kabi, uh, uh, Brother David Laraju. That is, this Brother David in Yoruba, that means that the person said in Yoruba that this Brother David takes things too seriously. And Oyedeko now said in Yoruba, that is, that it is that 
seriousness that has brought me this far. We don't know where, we don't know who that person was who made that comment, except for that, the fact that a serious person was the one, are you there referring to? Let's be serious. In Proverbs 21 verse 5, he said the thoughts of the lion tends only to plenteousness. Proverbs 21 verse 5. But everyone that is hasty only to want. So when a person is a diligent person, their, their thoughts provoke abundance. The thoughts of the lion tends only to plenty. One time I said only to plenty. So it's not just that you're just thinking, you must match your thoughts with the corresponding diligence needed to make it happen. In Proverbs 12, it says, The hand really shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Are you seeing that? The hands of the lion shall bear rule, but the hands of the slothful shall be under tribute. The hand of the lion shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Hallelujah. Romans tells us that the one who rules should rule with diligence. He that rules should rule with diligence. Which means sincerely, what you need in leadership, to succeed in leadership, you require, it requires diligence. There, now, let me share this very quickly because people like CEO title. But if you have CEO title, but you don't have CEO disposition to work, you will fail. CEO title. They like the title. I'm the CEO of the CEO of that CEO. It sounds very good. But CEO is about a disposition to work. Now he's saying something that, 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 that anybody who occupies that office of the chief executive whose book can't be a joker, can't be somebody who's just unserious. He has to put in the measure of diligence needed to make it work. A last scripture that speaks about Lillian Proverbs 12, 27 says, The sloth of man rules not what he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. The substance of a diligent man is precious. About two years ago, Pastor Keke came to bless us and he came for a Sunday service and he, he when he got back, he said to me, he said, he said, work has gone. <laughs> he said, work has gone into this place. A lot of work has gone in here. Into this place. He said, and he said, she means the work I do. <laughs> you know, he said to me, he was saying, he said, it's the work I do now. In other words, you can, you can tell if the pastor of a church is not serious. He said, ah, work has gone into this thing. Work has gone into this thing. Because the substance of a diligent man is precious. And people who work can recognize work. <laughs> he said, where? He said, no, it's the work I do now. What he was saying was, I'm also a pastor. So if I see a pastor that has worked, I can tell that, ah. <laughs> Are you getting this? The substance of a diligent man is precious. I'm also reminded now of uh, I think it was a woman uh, 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 one of these redeem what do they call this redeem she said, redeem the redeem praise leader. I've forgotten her name now, and she was going to be ministering for us for the first time, and as she stepped on the pulpit, she jumped. Hey! And said in Yoruba, Agbara so kalesibai. And I looked at the woman, you think we're playing or what? Or you think I'll be waiting on you to bring the power for the service or what? So the substance of a diligent person is precious. I can, you know, sometimes I, I'm with my, my peer and we, as we minister from place to place, we can tell that ah, this pastor is not serious, one is serious. Sometimes I say, ah, that place, what that, what that, you know. We go from church to church and say, ah, this is a what tree pastor. What tree? And you go to someone else and say, ah, you know. Because yeah, you're bringing an anointing, but it's a measure of work that should have been on ground. For where no wood is, the fire goes out. And so sometimes I won't tell the people I'm preaching for. I just say, ah, this place, man. Ah, this one. This church. Ah, serious. <laughs> so the substance of a brilliant man is precious. Amen. 
Some say why wouldn't tell them, ah, people don't like the truth. Though. So you don't say that you just celebrate you, sir. I celebrate you. Thank you. But please, are you joking or are you working? In your career, are you just joking or are you working? In your business, are you joking or are you working? In your marriage, are you joking or are you working? Even if you deal with a slack and your marriage cannot work, a lazy man's marriage can work. A lazy woman's marriage can work. Marriage is work. Think about the number of meals that a, a person will supervise. The number of meals. Then when you start having children, are you there? You cook for your husband, cook for your wife. Okay, even if you have cook, you still need to supervise. Okay, think about the number of times you have to sleep with your husband or wife. It's work. Hallelujah. Anything that works, people are working. Just don't have, just doesn't happen. So here we're talking about diligence. 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 Also makes fat. And that fatness, of course, gets rid of some things. I will never forget when I was studying Matthew chapter 20. And in studying Matthew chapter 20, I found out that the, the master of the vineyard went out to hire people at 6 a.m. And then he chose to pay them, I think, at the 11th hour or something like that. And I saw there a 12-hour work schedule. And I've tried to stick to that all the days of my life. Of course, no, but I have tried that a minimum of 12 hours of the day must be devoted to work. A minimum. The day I don't hit that, I repent. But it's very rare for me not to hit that. A, a, a minimum. Because there are a lot of people who are just trusting God for reward, but they're not putting in the effort. A minimum of 12 hours of every day must be devoted to work. Must. I do the math. I check it. I check the time. Must. And that's even minimum. That's basic minimum. Baseline. You want your finances to change. You want your resource level to change. Track it. Six months. 12 hours. Every day. Except your day of rest. And listen, the Bible does not rest. I, I'm seeing some things now that are from the pit of hell. They are talking about three-hour work days, four-hour work days. Satan will supply what to do in the remaining days. As far as the Bible is concerned, listen to me, there is only one day of break. Only one day. Every day is, is six days. Please give them the extra. Man is to go to his work for six days and he has one day of Sabbath. One day of rest. That's the divine order. One day of rest. Six days of work. So you need to, if you're going to explode and you're going to come to a point of comfort, you need to set up a minimum of 12-hour work schedule multiplied by six days. What's that? Is that 48 or 72? Okay, 72. Put in that stuff and watch what happens to your reward. Watch what happens to your reward. There's something about the universe. It responds to diligence. It responds to diligence. I'm not talking joking. I measure it. I track when I start working. I track when I stand work. I track it. It's not that. And I don't, can't leave it to chance. Because you can just gradually become slothful and be expecting that God will give you remuneration. Remember what I said in the morning? We're not bothered about our remuneration. We're bothered about contribution. Our contribution was supposed to be our remuneration was supposed to be. And it's not limited to the institution you work for. God can raise things to bless you. This is how we think. This is how we think. And it's really helped my life. You know, really helped my life. I, I, when I was young, <laughs> I, I, when I was not yet married, I had a lady who, I wasn't like this though. I was still around campus and all that. And then a lady that I was dating now came to me. Started dating. Maybe I asked her out and we started dating maybe uh, when we started a relationship. Ah. The next Monday, the ladies are scrolling to my, ho my house around 4 a.m. <laughs> I mean, around uh, maybe 9 a.m. in the morning. And I said to her, what did you come to look for? She said, I was bored. Uh, I said, come sit down. Let me tell you the story of her life. 
I said, if I was working in the bank, would you come to my office at the bank at 9 a.m. because you are bored? She was looking at me like this. I said, I don't, I don't go like that. Let me finish work, then I'll have time for you. I must finish my work if I have time for you. She was looking at me like this. Of course, I didn't marry her. I was the pastor. So, and I told her, if you won't do that to a banker, you won't go to a banker's office because you are bored or a doctor's office because you are bored. Why will you come to my own space? Because I'm a pastor. And that's how on seriousness begins to creep into people's, you know, space. And they're not giving ample time to the work and they're complaining about their... So I command every member of this church, every partner of this church, to set up a minimum of a 12-hour work schedule over the next six months and see what the Lord will do for your life. Amen. Or else, you get into slothfulness, he said he becomes poor that deals with his lack and your financial value will begin to reduce. That's why I measure, I measure my financial value, measure it, and God is just so amazing. And so what I want to focus on today, said that, Let's hold me for areas to develop diligence. Some areas you and I are to develop diligence. It's not going to happen accidentally. You're going to, you're going to have to cultivate a diligent spirit. Number one <laughs> is we must develop diligence in hearkening to the voice of God. First thing. Let me begin from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass if you shall hearken. Now, the word hearken is different from the word here. Hearken is a stronger form. It is hearing to do. Hearing to do, not just hearing. And it says, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, right? To observe to do according to all he commands, which I command you, this all his commandments, which I command you today, this day, the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations on the earth, and all these blessings, are you seeing that? Shall come on you, overtake you, if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your, your God. So here we're talking about hearkening to God's voice, hearkening. To God's voice, hearing God's voice with a view to do, with an, a, an inclination to do. That's the first area we must develop diligence. In Exodus 16, 15, 26, and if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these upon you, which I brought upon the Egyptians. So you are seeing here diligence in Heckner. Now, in this area, please, no matter what is offered to you, your, your, your blessing is in hearing from God and obeying Him. Diligence in hearing God. Heckner to God and obeying Him. Because a lot of people just do things, and is that what God said you should do? A friend just comes and says something you do. A spouse, my wife tell, knows that when my wife is talking to me, I'm always listening to her. I, I, I listen to her a lot, but I would only move on what God says. Hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Hearkening, what did God tell you? What did God say? If I had time, I'll share with you on the authority of the old prophet, young prophet. Don't let anybody deceive you. Obey God. Hallelujah. Hearkening. Be diligent. So today, one of the keys to my blessing, look at what it says. He says, he's going to bless you. All these blessings come upon you. Did you and then he says, he will set you on high above all nations. So your promotion is in that. Your blessing is in that. Hearing. What did God tell you? Sometimes I say, we'll do that. Is it what God told you? Do what God says you should do. Do what God tells you to do. Be diligent. I'm very deliberate at not to deviate from anything God says. 
<laughs> Anything God says, nobody can take me off the greed of what the Lord says. There's a scripture I saw in Zechariah 6 and verse 14 that blessed me some time ago. And it came back to me in this regard. He says, And the crown shall be on Helem and Tobijah and Jediah and Phanansbu, and to the hen, the son of Jephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off will come and build in the temple of the Lord, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent you, me to you. This shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Listen to me. What he's saying is, if you obey God, people will come from afar to come and build the temple of the Lord. So your development is a function of obeying God. It's not God will bring the men and the women that are because from the far country. When you're, a person is obeying God, God will move heaven and earth, move from move her limbs. He will move to bijas. He will move hands into what you are doing because you are operating in obedience, diligence. John two five, whatever He tells you to do, do it. We must become diligent in the application of the things that God has said we should do. Diligence in a heckling to the voice of God is an area we must develop. Every day, ladies and gentlemen, everything God says to me, that the thing I go do, what thing God tell me, I go do. Now, that may mean I'm stubborn to you, that's your business. But whatever God says to me to do, I will do. You must realize that reason why Saul was removed from office was because he did not, you studied that scripture, he did not do. He said, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you from being king. Are you seeing that? In other words, once you no longer hearken to do the word of the Lord, then God has to remove you from office. The same way in spiritual leadership, everyone in our space, who is not going to do what God has said. We will remove you. It's not anything. Else. I can appoint you today and remove you tomorrow. The only security of our leadership, therefore, is in obeying. Heckening. Obey the words. I don't have an everlasting position. You don't do what God said like that. I will commit you. You are going. You are, you are, it's not anything. You can't even stay hang around me. Somebody you can't even hang around me who will be doing what you God says you do. What are you saying? You are going. Why did he remove Saul? He removed Saul because Saul could not execute. It means when God raises spiritual leadership, he raises spiritual leadership to build in alignment with what God has said. Not they are not figure heads, they are there to do what God says should be done. Are you there? Because we, we know that if we can, if as a leader, now for instance, I can no longer do what God says should be done, either because of somebody else, ah, that means my, my leadership is over. I won't be a Saul. Ultimately, when Saul did not do what God said, God withdrew his mercy from him. He's saying also that you can give them the scriptures. I'm saying lots of things. It is, you see, obeying God guarantees mercy. Amen. <laughs> obeying God. So we must become diligent in obeying God. How much did God say you should be given? What percentage did he say you should be given? How did he say you should pray? How did he say you should do? Where did he say you should stay? Which location did he say you should do? What did he tell you? You don't mod modify divine instruction. What did God tell you? Not be looking like, I didn't know. What are you saying? My wife knows that when it comes to what God has says, ah. The, the, <clears throat> my wife doesn't even play with that. That's why we have a great, fruitful marriage. We don't toy around divine instruction. Because once we can no longer execute on divine instruction, we are no longer in leadership. We've lost the mercy of God. And we're on our way to being replaced. So we must decide to be diligent. Leaders are not yes men. We would execute on what he says. We must develop diligence in that. I can tell you all manner of things. If you pray for these people, I will bring them. So every member of this church, I pray for them. Every day. One hour. I've done it today. Instead of my family, you pray for the health of this family. You don't have to worry. I pray. I execute on divine instruction. Everything God tells me, to provide it, he tells me. Now me tell now, I will do it. Everything he tells me. And that's why our honor is intact, our glory is intact, our blessing is intact, our promotion is Because it's all in what God said. Ask the people who work closely to me. Most of the things I told them, God said, we saw it. 
How did the Exeter Convention Center raise? We were saving money. Nothing was happening there. For five months, the property did not move. God said, what are you doing? We'll save again. We'll spend. We'll save again. God said, take that two million now and go and sow that two million into this project. I can tell you where God said to me. And I called the finance office and said, God said, we should take this two million. Look, it, it rose. It has not stopped since then. <laughs> It has not stopped since then. That's what he was saying here in Zechariah. That if it, all these things about people coming to support what you are doing will come to pass, Zechariah 6 verse 15, if you diligently obey the voice of God. So those who obey God, don't beg men. Don't beg men. The obedience compels support from the right, from the left. People come to help. Because the man is obeying. We must develop diligence in this regard. Number two, we must develop diligence in guarding our hearts. I dare say, Mr. There are some people's houses that are more secure than their hearts. Now, you have a house where you live, right? You have a house. Do you just leave the gates open? <laughs> Do you just leave the doors open? Many people guard their houses better than they guard their hearts. In Proverbs 4, 20, it says, guard your heart, keep your heart with all diligence. All diligence. Not just casually. The heart must be protected with all diligence because out of that heart are the issues of life. Your heart must be guarded. If you are going to su succeed, your heart must be, listen to me, I guard my heart dangerously. It's not that I don't leave it to chance. My heart is not easy to access. I guard it with all diligence. I can terminate relationships in an instant. What kind of stuff is this? Don't matter if you're a bishop. Don't matter what the person is, whether it's a bishop or a reverend, whatever he is. I relate with everybody based on the influence they have on my heart. And once I start to bring some strange things to my hearing, hey, I'm gone, man. With all diligence, you can't leave it to chance. Especially in this social media age, you can't leave your heart care and its defense to chance. It must be guarded deliberately. Let me talk about Papa Iboda, Papa KK. Do you know why I'm still following them till tomorrow? It's because nobody could reach me about them. I could not be reached. I'm the, their most unreachable song. <laughs> most unreachable. You know what I mean? I'm mo nobody in their crimes can reach me with nonsense. I can't even be reached. Not possible. That in my heart. Very important. One is you have to guard your heart from external influences, negative external influences. And then you also have to guard it from negative internal influences. Because in Hebrews, they're looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up and trouble you, thereby many be defiled. So there are some times that some things are springing up from within you. What you are saying is that the things that come out of a man are the things that defy him. Because the heart is desperately wicked. You can't just leave the condition of your heart to chance. Sometimes it is associations on the outside, conversations on the outside that get your heart. Sometimes the heart on its own is generating its own wickedness. You have to guard it. He said because if you allow roots of bitterness spring up within you, many things will be defiled. He said, lest there be any fornicator or any profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of me sold his birthright for you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected because he found no place of repentance though he sought it diligently with hell. So on one hand, you're guarding your heart from negative external influences and you're also guarding your heart either associations and things like, for instance, when Jesus was declaring his purpose, right? It is the people closest to you that Satan can use to get to you. It's the people closest to you. It's the people closest to you that Satan will use to get to you. 
Oh, you're not going to fulfill God. He said, get out behind me, Satan. The only thing that is telling you, anything telling you, speaking contrary to the plan and the purpose of God for your life is Satan. It could be your wife, but it's Satan. It could be your husband, but it's Satan. Anything speaking contrary. He was saying it out of concern. You will not go and but the assignment, the cross was his assignment. Sometimes the people who have your best interest at heart can be the greatest enemy of your purpose. Because now this was the cross. He was saying, I'm going to go and die. I'm going to go through a dying process. This is the cross. And the person said, No, 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 you can't be done that. You can't do that. Ask my wife, you tell you something. When I was moving to Lagos, they told me. They couldn't tell me already, but they went to her. Now that why is he leaving for Lagos? This place, they already know you. The church is successful. If I had followed that voice, I would have died right now. I would have been dead by now. So we must guard our hearts from external influences, negative, from internal influences. By that, you judge every influence by what its, its, its implication for your purpose. Every voice in your life, you judge it based on its implication for the assignment of God. If the assignment is aiding the purpose of God for your life, lifting that purpose, fueling that purpose is a good voice. If the assignment is bringing confusion, <laughs> it's not a good voice. But get very careful about things like this. Sometimes it can come from, it can come from anybody to the degree to which they are. So we must guard it. Ask if that one, you have neither part or lot in this matter because your heart is not right in the sight of God. So basically, it is how God sees our heart in his sight that he makes us give us our respective parts. So nobody can say anybody. It's what God sees in our heart in his sight, not in my sight. How do I know what's in your heart? Can I know what's in your heart? No, it's God. He said, you have no part or lot in this matter <laughs> because your heart is not right in the sight of God. We must be diligent, ladies and gentlemen, in guarding our hearts. I'm blessing somebody this evening. Number three is that we must be diligent in our business. In your business. You know, there are people that, who are more diligent in other people's businesses than their own. That's why their life is not making progress. They are diligent in other people's business. See, there's a man who is in his own business. Give them first Thessalonians 4, first Thessalonians 4 and verse 11. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own, your own, your own, your own. Not my own, your own business. Your own. So there is something that is called your business. If there is something called your business, there is what is not your business. When people's business becomes stagnant, it's because they have become <laughs> more conscious of other people's business. And they are, you know me, now my business consigned me. <laughs> I don't even know what's happening. In, look, there are many churches on our streets. I do, you be amazed. I don't even know what's happening in the next church to us. That is that we share fence. I don't know what the name of the church is, <laughs> who the pastor of the church is, what is happening there. One way you know bad people, they know too much that is not their business. Poisonous people. Oh man, now so there are some that now their own business, nothing is happening. They have accumulated the business of other people in their head, in their spirit, to the point where their own business. You've seen that scripture. Stop trying to remove another person's log. Amen. Focus on the removing of your own log, your the log that's in your eye. Then you will see clearly to remove. He's saying here, you must first of all take care of your life. Focus on your life. That's how I think. He started to be quite your own business. Be diligent in his own business, not in other people's business. In fact, one scripture says that none of us be busy bodies in other men's business. You know that scripture? Busy bodies in other men's businesses. And what you'll notice, what is common to those people who are obsessed with other people's lives is their life seldom makes progress. Be diligent in your business. Hallelujah. The fact that certain crises erupt in your area does not mean you are the one to attend to it. Acts chapter 6. six. Are you there? Acts chapter 6. There arose a murmuring among the Grecians and the Jews 
and they came with a loot and said, uh, we have been neglected. Our widows have been neglected in the daily ministration. Peter said, it is not reason for us to leave the word of God and to start. That is even in your sphere. Some things are not your business. He says, we will give ourselves to prayer. We are the leaders of the job, but we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Look for men full of the Holy Ghost of honest report who we can appoint over this business. And when they did that, the word of God increased. So the fact that I'm the head of the church doesn't mean everything happening in church is my business. You must know how to stick with your business, my business, my business, my business. What is my business? What is expected of me? What would, what would I be measured for? What can I do? In what area can my action make the greatest impact and significance? And the word of God increased, Acts chapter 6. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem because they focused on their focus. You saw here specialization in the early church. Specialization. The seven men stayed over the material business of the word of God. Why the man of God focused on the primary and the rest is history. Be diligent in your business. Connected to this, Proverbs 27, verse 10, 27, 27, verse 23, is to be diligent to know this state of your own flocks. Your own flocks. Look well to your herds. For riches and forever. Now, when we're saying your own flock here, we're dealing, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking here about, we're talking about your products, your own products, your own services, your competence. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Look well to your own heads. Sometimes people try to reach out to me, and once I find you, I know a member of the church, there's also a way I don't give access to you. You know, get pastor. Are you getting what I'm saying here? You're not a member of the church, so what, what are you doing? You're not a son of our ministry, so what are you doing? You're not answering between what, are, what am I doing? Your flocks look well to your hearts. He said, For riches are not forever. He said, Neither does the crown endure to every generation. He says, The hair appears. If I like how the message translation puts it, the message translation puts it like that if you add, if you pay attention to the state of your flocks, you will have enough. You will have enough. You will be able to use the proceeds of your products, your services, your own assignment. <laughs> Stop jumping about. Be diligent. Please give them a message translation of that stuff. You will have enough wool. And he said, because these things are not forever. Rich are not forever. And neither does the crown endure to every generation. So focus on your own business. I consider it the greatest prayer to preach at the end of the assembly. There's no other place I consider as more, 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 more. Look, I go out to preach, but that's not what I'm after. I don't want to be like that Songs of Solomon man who says, I've heard help other people keep their own. Uh, I'm black. I help other people keep their own vineyard. My own vineyard. Degraded. Are you there? Be diligent to know the state of your flock. If you're a businessman, be diligent. If you're a banker, be diligent to know the state. As you are diligent in your assignment, you become distinguished. It is diligence that makes you distinguished. Amen. You, if you are not diligent in it, you cannot be distinguished in it. The way I look at this, you know, I look at our church and all that. Nobody in this church has to come to me and say, sir, you should have preached it like this. It's my, that's my business now. Eh? But I can tell you a lot of people saying, I said you should have done like this. That means in your own area, you have not mastered the area. I am striving to master my area. So, you have become a master because when I look at your work, there will be nothing for me to correct in your own work. That's why you sit down with your work. You master it. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. Let me press on because of time. Number four, as I begin to bring it to a close. <laughs> Be diligent to make your calling and your election sure. When I saw this scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall or fail. That's verse 10. It dawned on me that the fact that you are called does not mean it is sure. And the fact that you are elected does not mean it is sure. Oh, I'm a pastor. I'm a bishop. The fact that you are called does not, your calling does not make it sure. And your election does not make it sure. 
It is your diligence that makes the calling an election sure. Now, what was he saying there? He now says, what you need to do in verse 5 is that besides or giving all diligence, add, there will be things to add. Add to your faith, virtue. To your virtue, knowledge. To your knowledge, temperance. To your temperance, patience. To your patience, godliness. To your godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you, one, and they abound, two, they will ensure that you will not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off. But has forgotten that he was purged of his old sins. Wherefore, he says, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. So, faith is the foundation. You now have to develop diligence in adding other things to that faith. You'll be adding things. You'll be adding things. It is what you now add that will make it sure. <laughs> be diligent. That you're calling an election sure. Be diligent. Is it remember what I told you? It is in my book. I live in the world. It's not anything. I live in it. It's not that thing. I live in it. <laughs> An average day can be less than five to six to seven hours in the world. That's not me. That's not you. But that's me because I'm a pastor. So, I mean, I'm sinking in it. It's not anything. Sinking. Commentaries, this, that. Sinking in it. And us prayer and even other things like that. I must, I guess, the fact that you're called, I'm called, I'm called. I've been appointed. You can lose the appointment. You have to, they can give you an appointment, you can lose it because after you have been appointed, you have to argue that appointment diligence. Secular, if they give you an appointment letter, does that mean that anything? The appointment letter they give you now doesn't mean that you can't be fired next week. You must be, you, now you have the appointment, then you must now give the appointment the diligence it requires to make sure it is sure. <laughs> because give us understanding. Number five, we must be diligent in the application of the word of God. I'll pick one scripture. You have commanded us to Keep your precepts diligently. Psalms 119 verse, verse 4. You commanded us to keep your precepts, how? Diligently. In James 1 verse 22, it says, Be ye doers of the word of God, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his nature, our face in the mirror. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what, what kind of man he is. But he who looks at the path of law of liberty, and continues in it. He looks in it. He continues in it. It's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. The same man shall be blessed in his deed. So, to be blessed in the word, you look into it, number one. When you look into it, you continue in it. James, James chapter 8 and verse 32. You con John chapter 8 verse 32. You continue in it. 31 says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth. A person who does not continue in your word is not your disciple. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Three, he's not a forgetful hearer. Four, he's a doer of the word. He looks into the word of God. He continues in the word of God. He is not a forgetful hearer. He's a doer of the work that the world requires. That man will be blessed in his deed. So we must be diligent in the application of the word of God. I, I, I think I have to stop at this. Okay, I have to do, let me do two more. I'm your pastor for the rest of your life so I can continue some other time. Diligence. These are word practitioners. They are, they are doing the word. <laughs> They're not living life. They are doing the word. I have taught you before, Matthew chapter 7. The difference between those who are living and building, the one who is building is the one who hears and does. If you are not, <laughs> let's just press on. So diligence. Number seven is diligence in the education of our children as I begin to round up tonight. Diligence. Your children are a trust. There should be a time hmm, when you share with your children all your stories. I've 
for you just talk about homework where I share my children and all my stories. All my stories. In Jeremiah, he said, and these words which I have commanded you today shall be in your heart. You will teach the word that I have put in your heart diligently to your children. You will talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You will bind the word for a sign in your hand. You will be, they will be as frontless between your eyes and you will write them on the post of your house and on your gates. You know, if you interact with the word on this level, he said, it shall be. <laughs> it will be. When the Lord shall have brought you into the land which you saw to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, brought you in the land which you saw to give you great and goodly cities which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, wells digged which you did not dig, <laughs> vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and before, beware. He's saying something very powerful here. The word of God that he's giving you, must you must teach it to your children. Your children must be possessors of your revelation. Jeremiah 2, 9, verse 9. Your, your children must not be ignorant of your revelation. So we must also be diligent in educating our children in the word of God. Psalm 78 tells us a bit about this. I open my mouth in a parable. I utter dark sayings which you have, we have heard and known. Our fathers have told us we will not hide them from our children. We will tell them to the generation to come the praises of Lord and his strength and his wonderful work which he had done. He established as a testimony in Jacob. He appointed it as a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children so that the generation coming might know them. The children who will be born. So God does not want our children to be ignorant of the things we know. We must teach them systematically and deliberately so that these children know the things we know. They know the things that brought us. They know the principles that brought us this far. He said, because if we don't, these children won't know it. And what will happen is they'll be like the children of Ephraim. Please give them that scripture of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows. It turned back in the day of battle. So let me explain. He's saying if you don't educate your children in your principles of the word of God, the testimonies, your children will now face challenges in the future that they will turn back from because you did not tell them the stories, their dealings with you, how God raised you, how God helped you. So you must teach, just teach, we must be diligent in the education of our children. Hallelujah. Diligent. Telling them how God brought you, how you gave birth to them, the principles you applied, the things you did to get where you are, you must be deliberate about this. Listen to me, those children are with you. I'm waking up that those children are about to go in my house. My first child, I go to university. From then on, you, they'll send more time away from you. If you don't maximize their time with you, you may never know those children. You must be diligent in educating our children. Lastly, I would have said you should be diligent in seeking the Lord. Hebrews 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. But those, <laughs> in, in please him, but the one who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder, not of everybody, of those that diligently seek him. But you know that. Let me add one more to it and I'll stop here for the night. So we must be diligent in educating our children. Lastly, let us be diligent in entering our rest. Ah, I want to show you a scripture that changed my life. In the book of Jeremiah, it was 17, verse 24 to verse 25. This thing, if you see this thing, things will begin to flow into you. It was a Lord showed me many years ago. I brought about establishment in our ministry. And it shall come to pass, if you did it, the hearken unto me, saying the Lord, to bring in nobody through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day. You're bringing nobody in. You've entered your rest. You hallow the Sabbath day and you do no work in them. When you enter your rest, then there shall enter into the gates of the city kings and priests sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, their princes, men of Judah, inhabitants. He says they will come and this city will remain forever. Listen to me. There is what you must enter for kings to enter, for resources to enter, 
for blessings to enter. Look at that scripture. Go and study it. He said, when you enter into your rest, you're bringing nobody into the gates of the city. You hallow the gates of the city. In fact, King James said, you're not going about your own doing business. I mean, message. Then you shall enter. Listen, it is when you enter your rest that the things God has for you begin to enter. When you enter, things will begin to enter. Go and study that scripture. Before that scripture, there were no cars in our church. I entered my rest. And then all kinds of things. Members, I can tell you the scripture. I ate it. And I leave it. Rest is powerful. You must be diligent in entering your rest. Hebrews 4 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. In that Jeremiah scripture, what we're saying is that when you enter your rest, when it's no longer a burden, that's when it will come in. When, when, when money is no longer a burden, oh, oh, money, 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 hey, husband, 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 hey, wife, 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 kind of thing. baby, baby, baby. When you have entered your rest, go and study Hebrews 4, verse 1 to the end. When you've entered your rest, that's when I found out, ladies and gentlemen, that God works best when man is at rest. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about sleeping for 20 hours. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking about spiritual rest. And you have to labor in the word of God to enter into a point of rest on that matter. And at that point, things must begin to enter. So we must be diligent to enter into our rest. My counsel tonight is simple. It says here, the diligent man is one who's going to be made fat. And these are seven or so areas that must begin to cultivate diligence so that God will honor us with precious substances. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that the mantle of diligence will rest upon you. In the name of Jesus, I strip you of that slack hand. Grace to take your life seriously, to take your career seriously, to take your calling seriously. Grace not to joke with the mandate of God for your life. Let it rest upon you right now. And by virtue of your diligence, attain a level of richness and fatness that you have never known before. In Jesus' mighty name. This Sunday, we're going to be anointing you. And for the next six days, we're going to pray out everything we taught in these three days. Everything you've heard will take on tangibility and materiality in your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Be diligent. God bless you. Jesus. Are you for me or not? Uncertainty can be very dangerous, especially in the matters of the heart. Introducing how to tell if someone's heart is with you and for you. A timeless book by best-selling author D.G. Olabode to guide you through troubleshooting and making crystal clear decisions on matters of the heart. Now available on Amazon, Kindle, DGOlabode.com and bookstores nationwide. For more information and partnership, contact Dome on 70 35 85 9710. Join the Saturday Powerhouse Prayers with Reverend DJ Olabode at the Scepter Convention Center. Time 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. every Saturday. Then is the Scepter Convention Center. Plot 2, Latif Jakonde, Agedimbi Ikeja. You can also join the live stream on all official and Truman Assembly streaming platforms. We are live on site and online every Sunday at the Enthronement Assembly for two power packed services the first service at 7 30 a.m. and the second service at 9 30 a.m. Venue is Neka House Ikeja. And if you're out of town, you can join live on all Enthronement Assembly streaming platforms, ministering live, Reverend Dejola Body, activating and actualizing God's royalty in you.